So hello everybody again. <laughs> now with a mic and uh, good to see you. And I will start with the prayers. In the Buddha Dharma and the Supreme Assembly, I take refuge and I attain enlightenment. Through the merit of practicing generosity and the rest, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. In the Buddha Dharma and the Supreme Assembly, I take refuge until I attain enlightenment. Through the merit of practicing generosity and the rest, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. In the Buddha Dharma and the Supreme Assembly, I take refuge until I attain enlightenment. Through the merit of practicing generosity and the rest, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. May all sentient beings enjoy happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the sacred happiness devoid of suffering. May they dwell in boundless equanimity that is free from attachment and aversion. May all sentient beings enjoy happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the sacred happiness devoid of suffering. And may they dwell in boundless equanimity that is free from attachment and aversion. May all sentient beings enjoy happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the sacred happiness devoid of suffering. May they dwell in boundless equanimity that is free from attachment and aversion. The skillful means and compassion you were born in the Shakya clan. Unconquerable by others, you vanquished Mara's faults. Your physical form resplendent like a mountain of gold. To you, the king of Shakyas, I pay homage. So that's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good to see you. And I hope you are all well. And health wise, <laughs> mentally, physically, <laughs> and um, spiritually. So let's maybe start. Um, yeah, I think you all know what we are doing, that we are going through Shantideva's uh, sixth chapter at the moment on patience. And, um, and in this context, anger is the problem. And why is that? Um, because um, I don't know if you know this um, ground path and fruit um, kind of categories of every uh, vehicle um, in Buddhism. And if we look at it from the Mahayana point of view, then we have um, the ground are the two truth, relative and absolute. And this will be, we will uh, learn in the ninth chapter. And then the path are the two accumulations of merit and wisdom. And that is, this is what we are dealing here. We are dealing with the merit side. And then the result are the two kayas, like the Dharmakaya. So, mm, mm, so that one is enlightened and not suffering oneself. And then the Rupakaya, the form Kaya, to benefit others, to also lead them to enlightenment. So in that context, we are on the path and we are talking about uh, where we talk about merit and wisdom. And here we're talking about merit. And here Shadideva is saying, anger is destroying merit. So that is where we are. Hi, Daniel. <laughs> um, so th that is where we are, that uh, Shantideva is saying we need merit and anger is destroying it. And, um, and therefore, He's asking us not to be angry, not to be impatient, not to be jealous. I think that was actually the main topic last week. And uh, because all of that is, um, yeah, is creating an atmosphere in our mind where we don't have peace or positivity or wisdom. And um, so therefore, um, whenever we perceive enemies or obstacles, we should deal with them wisely. And, um, and so that is 
I think the topic of the whole sixth chapter and also here of today's verses, which start um, with number 102, which looks like this. Um, so just the first line, but what if someone should obstruct my gaining merit? So that that is um, our virtual opponent or maybe our doubt, you know? Since I said earlier, you know, in Mahayana, ground, path and fruit, merit is essential on the path. Um, therefore, we don't want that, um, that somebody is um, obstructing uh, our accumulation of merit. That is the doubt that is mentioned here in the first line, and um, and yeah, the the, the the background story behind that is, um, for example, um, if somebody is is mean to us or um, destroying our reputation or maybe stealing our possessions. Um, then, for example, when our reputation is destroyed, then maybe people will not sponsor us anymore. Or if they steal our possessions directly, then the same result, you know, we don't have possessions, we don't have money or financial means. And therefore we, we ourselves cannot offer much um, or we cannot sponsor temples or statues or stupas, or we cannot go to a retreat. And therefore that is sort of the logic here, Therefore, we have less chance to accumulate merit, you know, if our reputation is destroyed or if our possession is stolen. Um, yeah, so that, that is maybe our doubt. And therefore, our doubt thinks that it's justified, therefore, to be angry if somebody is mean to us, if somebody is spreading rumors about us. Um, because uh, these rumors basically block our dharma practice or if somebody is disturbing our meditation you know we think that is an obstacle and that is an enemy and therefore let's get angry um <clears throat> but shantideva is saying um no um <laughs> this, this answer. so the, the the last three uh, sentences here with him too the enemy too it is incorrect to be angry for since there is no fortitude fortitude similar to patience, surely I should put it into practice. So the point here is, um, if we say, oh, this enemy is, is obstructing us to accumulate merit, then Shantideva is basically saying, no, the best way to accumulate merit is by practicing patience. And um, yeah, for example, if somebody is, um, disturbing our meditation, you know, because he or she is noisy and so on, then yes, we could um, get angry with this person and saying, hey, I'm doing something holy here. But um, we could also see our patience practice then as the best meditation and as the best practice in that situation. And therefore we don't see that enemy or obstacle as, um, yeah, as an obstacle or uh, obstruction, but we just um, change our perspective and see that person uh, or that situation as something um, where we can practice patience with. with. Uh, and that is, um, yeah, and, and that then will um, guarantee, or maybe not guarantee, but uh, will help us to have a peaceful and calm mind and stay open and uh, not be so full of glaciers. And, um, and yeah, and Shantideva was already praising the importance of patience and the many good effects and advantages of patience. Therefore, again, um, we appreciate actually everything and everyone who is giving us that opportunity to practice patience. And uh, therefore, yeah, we see that person actually as, um, as somebody who is actually the result of our good karma. You know, the enemy is, is the result of our good karma because he or she is giving us the chance to practice patience and therefore um, to progress on the path. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you, you are now, uh, now already very familiar with 
Shanti Devas. Um, 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 not twisted, but yeah, <laughs> different logic, <laughs> different perspective, and uh, which is more uh, directed towards liberation and not uh, directed towards samsara. Because from a samsaric perspective, of course, we get angry, and um, but that didn't lead us anywhere and will not lead us anywhere. So that's why it's good to twist that and change um, our perspective. Yeah, and that of course goes with people, but also with situations. You know, whenever there's, uh, whenever we want to do something good, I don't know, going to a retreat, going to a Dharma teaching, or practicing, then we think, yeah, that is how we accumulate merit. But then, if somebody is stopping us or obstructing us, or if something is obstructing us or stopping us to do so, then yeah. Um, then it's just a matter of changing perspective and, and understanding that if we practice then patience with these so-called obstacles, then that is a Dharma practice and then that is a Dharma teaching. And so it's, it's not different from what we originally wanted to do, but it's just another setting or another object um, of our Dharma practice. And Shantideva continues in verse 103. Mm. So if due to my own failings, I'm not patient with this enemy, then it is only I who am preventing myself from practicing this cause for gaining merit. Yeah, so the whole logic of verse 102 only works if you actually practice patience because only then we, uh, we really, let's say, accumulate merit. Um, but um, but if, if it's the opposite, if we follow our negative or usual habits, like being angry with the enemy or jealous with somebody or irritated by whatever situation, um, and then we become impatient and um, and then yeah, then then we we come. We, we 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 stay in our usual dualistic perception of the enemy being hundred percent wrong, and the enemy is to blame, and yeah, then we don't have any chance to self reflect and um, see our own failures or weaknesses, um, and yeah, then we so if we if we are full of pleasures, like we have a jealousy attack, you know, then then. Um, then yeah, we would think yeah, if this person wouldn't exist, then I could practice dharma. So that that would be our usual samsaric habit. Um, but yeah, we have. Uh, but we. But the situation, as Shantideva in the earlier verse said, is actually uh, yeah might seem difficult, but actually that is maybe the greatest chance you know, for us to to progress. And then uh, Shantideva is concluding, so if we lose our temper and if we get this, um, these negative emotions, uh, then, then that is the point where we actually uh, destroy our marriage. And uh, so that is self-made, you know? Um, and then we are our own biggest enemy, our own demon or obstacle. And then, yeah, um, in the beginning of chapter six, uh, Shantideva was saying that already, you know, how much um, uh, negative impact that has, you know, if we are angry and how much merit is destroyed uh, by that uh, for, for so many kaipas. I mean, uh, yeah, that was maybe pedagogic pedagogically or figuratively only spoken, but a lot of merit will be destroyed. By, by that kind of strong anger. And then, yeah, the only result of us being impatient is that we destroy our own merit. And by that we delay or postpone our own enlightenment. And therefore we actually, um, not directly sort of, but, but, but indirectly we, we, um, we, uh, we are responsible sort of responsible for the suffering of many beings because they were they are waiting for us to, to attain enlightenment and if we delay that 
then their suffering continues. And so therefore, yeah, patience is very important and, and anger is very destructive. So what do you think? <laughs> It's of course, as everything in Shantideva's text, it's always easier said than done, right? But um, nevertheless, it's good to have a different view on it and then um, slowly, slowly getting used to it. Okay, Changshuk was writing something. So if other person anger at you, he's generating negative karma too. So what is useful way to reduce it? Yeah, that was actually um, more in the beginning of, of this chapter. Um, the, um, that is, the, this sort of, we cannot take away from this person. You know, if he or she is angry, um, then that is um, a pity, of course. And it's it's difficult, and, and then the moment he or she is angry, then that moment already, yeah, some negative karma is created. You know, some tendencies are solidified, some compassion is destroyed. You know, and some mental peace is destroyed, and so on. So, and then if so, the best would be, of course, if we if we would be able to prevent that from happening. If so, if we try not to provoke others unskillfully um, maybe skillfully sometimes it's good especially if, if if you have a good relationship with this person and maybe um, that is sort of a deal you know that one can support each other on the path <laughs> yes poking a little bit um, but um, um, but generally yes so so that would be good to prevent but if that person is already anger angry then yeah try everything to to out of compassion to um, to help him or her to to, to calm down um, as quickly as possible, um, and and then what? So so the motivation should be like that, and the so that is our compassionate motivation. But then we need, of course, wisdom and skillful means to then in a specific situation to know how to do that. Um, you know digestible uh, form, you know, because maybe um, person A is getting more angry if, angry if we are just silent or if we are leaving the room. Um, and then maybe person B is getting more angry, angry if we are uh, starting to discuss or debate. Um, so therefore we, we need to find the right method. Um, with the right in that situation but yeah love is sort of the answer <laughs> so if we, if we show that we care and that we don't and if if we try not to escalate the situation that is already good you know but if we try to be empathetic and understanding <laughs> so that, that's yeah I think these general answers, um, uh, but um, and also we can. Um, I think Shantideva is saying that also in sort of in the middle of chapter six, um, since the enemy is helping us to uh, generate patience, um, he or she is very helpful on our path, and therefore yes, we accumulate a lot of marriage. Um, because this person triggered that difficult situation and therefore we, we can dedicate the merit to this person. And maybe that is a good bridge to Katya's point here. Could you talk a bit about the practice of dedicating merit to avoid losing it? I'm always confused about how that works. Yes, I don't know either how that works, you know, it's like, um, if it would really work, you know, then we would have all the merit because the Buddhas would have dedicated or have dedicated all the merit already to all sentient beings. And therefore we would be overflowing with merit. And um, of course, I don't know about you, but I would not be in the state that I'm in. <laughs> and um, and so, so therefore 
it can't really work so so much in the sense that I dedicate a merit to my merit merit to somebody else and he or she is really getting it. So that maybe to some extent some positivity or good wishes are mm, transferred. But um, it's definitely a mind training for us um, because um, that was also part of the third chapter um, that Shantideva is saying we are attached to three things, which is, oh, I forgot, I think, they are wealth and body and merit. So therefore these three we constantly should dedicate and share with others and um, and so, and even though if that is not immediately affecting others, but it helps us to let go of these three things, or in this case, what you ask, merit. So that is an important part, so that we learn to let go of whatever we like or whatever we treasure most. Mm. And wealth is, of course, very important for this life, and our body is very important for this life. But merit is very important for next lives. Um, so therefore, we are actually <laughs> learning to let go of um, the attachment to good future lives, you know, which would be, which would be an obstacle if we would have that um, attachment to pleasurable future lives. And um, then another point of while dedicating merit, which which will come a lot in the tenth chapter, of course. Um, is that um, we dedicate the merit to a specific aim. So, um, and, and therefore, if we if we do that, then then it is said that um, this merit lingers until that aim is reached. So, if I only dedicate the merit for for the attainment or achievement of tomorrow's lunch, you know, then after the lunch sort of that's done, you know, then um, it was nice and it was uh, happiness, but it was very temporal and very, um, um, yeah, not so super profound, right? And yeah. and so that that's it, you know, but if we dedicate it to something that is permanent sort of, because it's beyond time, you know, Buddhahood of all sentient beings. And if it's not, um, if it's really profound because um, we, we dedicate it to the Buddhahood of all beings, that is profound because all sufferings are excluded by that. It's not the small suffering of having hunger tomorrow lunchtime that is excluded or eliminated, but it's, um, it's much vaster and much more profound and much more long lasting. Mm. So there are some criteria. Um, then it is said that this um, merit then is is active until that aim is reached. Mm. So they assume we have that mental power to do direct positivity in one direction, and then it's working in that direction uh, until that is reached. And the classic example is, um, yeah, that uh, even though I only have a drop of water, but if I keep it in my hand, you know, then um, yeah, this might not work because you can't see it. Mm. <laughs> You have red juice here. That would be very good. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's if you have a little bit water in our hand, you know, then it goes through our fingers and we lose it. We lose the merit. But if we put that same amount of water, which is only teeny tiny, in an ocean, you know, then it sort of mingles inseparably with the whole ocean. And then our little water or merit um, stays until the whole ocean is dried up. So therefore, it's also like a protection if we, if we dedicate. And we have to protect it against um, anger, especially. I think that was maybe the main starting point of your question. And <clears throat> yeah, and anger is, is the opposite of merit, like very crudely speaking, or opposite of sharing or dedicating merit, because merit is something very positive, something that creates the atmosphere of um, the dawn of wisdom and anger is very negative and it makes the dualism bigger between you and me and it is um, uh, it is making the mind more dark so we have less wisdom so therefore merit can be easily destroyed by its opposites and therefore we have to protect it like that
um, one more question before we continue. Well, yeah, I, a remark or statement. I had a question. Uh, so um, when when we have an enemy who is basically creating an obstacle in like, for example, doing our practice or anything that we are doing for dharma, and uh, this person is deliberately creating obstacle. So. I mean, just want to understand as in what can be the step where we also do the dharma, but not lose the anger. So we take the action of doing whatever we had to anyways, but not get angry with this person. Is that? No, but it's, so you want to do both, you're saying. Um... Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not getting angry with this person. This person is creating the obstacles in whatever that is, but we do the we, but we do whatever we have to do anyways. But it will anger the person who's creating obstacles. So will that also work against the creation of merit or in this situation? I think I don't get the the the. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, can you try this? So, so there's. So there is X person who is like really creating obstacles and the Y yes. person is really wanting to do something, want to go some, somewhere or do a particular task. But this X person is like kind of creating obstacles, is not liking it. And the Y person is really wanting to do it. And the Y person does this anyway, goes ahead, but doesn't lose patience or and is, doesn't get angry with X who's creating the obstacles. Okay, but that without the bad motivation of not getting angry, but doing it anyways. But uh, on the other hand, this person who's creating the obstacles gets upset and angry anyway. So are we also responsible for uh, that? For the anger, anger of this other person? Yeah, the person who's creating the ob uh, obstacle, like if the person gets angry anyway, and we don't get angry about this person creating obstacles, but go ahead and do what we have to do anyway. But we've created that anger within X person. So are we also in this equation? Like, do we also have to, uh, <laughs> you know? Um but you just said we created the anger in this other person. So, so we did no, something we, that- We didn't, cre we didn't we create, didn't. this person is, or this person is anyways angry and does not, <laughs> like want, does not want us to do a particular thing or want us to go ahead with anything or make us do anything. But why is come to a situation where, you know, whatever you say, I'm going to do it anyways and I'm not going to get angry. It's okay, you get angry, it's fine, it's your whatever, but- yeah. uh, I think that it sounds healthy, but still we can try to to help the other person to be less angry. Um, no, so, even yeah, though he, even though he or she has no right to actually say something against our um, endeavors, yeah. um, and he or she is not in the position, um, but but we, we we at least can try not to yeah escalate the situation and and uh, trigger more anger. But if this person is really like unrelated to us and it's really not his or her business, then, then maybe it's also good to tell that person, um, I'm sorry that you're upset, but this is really not your business. It's not your concern. And maybe that is a good learning lesson for the other person. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I, I didn't get it properly. Um, no, no, you got it. You got it. But <laughs> it's not very easy, you know, in such a situation. That's why I put that question. Like, even if we try to pacify the person saying that, you know, I'm going for something good. So you you getting angry is not really like really helping, but this person is angry anyway, no matter what. Yeah, that, that, that part, and maybe Jan, Janabi can answer your question soon. Um, but um, <laughs> but this anyway put is your not, hand up. That's why. <laughs> but this is anyway is 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 um, is a little bit too fatalistic maybe because yeah it, we can in, we have an influence also. So um, it's not determined that, yeah, that it is, yeah, so maybe it can be a little bit of a good influence. It, I don't know, that's really difficult to say because some teachers also said, you know, if you have um, a positive project that you want to do, and if, for example, there's one person who is always against it and who's always difficult and you tried often to, to tame his or her mind, you know, and if it just doesn't work, 
then yes, just ignore that person really. And and because it's an endless uh, waste yeah. of energy and time just to spend on this one person, mm-hmm. and just focus your energy like practically on a bigger opt- a bigger project. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, no. The reason that I mean, I've always been doing this anyway because I don't really. <laughs> it doesn't Ignoring matter to me because what I what I have to do, I will do it anyways. I I just thought maybe it's a different scenario when it comes into a dharma situation because these two people are like close, they're connected, and then there is something that is created because of this person's, you know. So I just thought maybe there's another way to you know pacify or just. Yeah, I think I'm not so creative at the moment with my answer, but I think Danielle wanted to answer something to or, or share something in that regard. No, I saw your hand. Uh, and Janavi, did you want to say something to that? On that, I didn't want to say, but I had a separate question. Okay, but let, let's see. I will, Palavi, I will have it in mind and maybe later I, I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something more substantial. I mean, I mean and it, it doesn't need to necessarily have an answer, but I just thought, like, it, is it different in the Dharma scenario where? Somewhere we are like a little bit of responsible in creating this anger in somebody else. That's my only thing. That's why. Yeah, but maybe um, maybe one example comes to mind. You know, when 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 you are married with somebody who is totally against your dharma practice, you know, and he or she doesn't like your meditation every evening, um, then yeah, that um, then then it's maybe yeah, then still do your meditation, but also discuss with that person. You know, in a as calm as possible setting, you know. Um, I mean, we cannot let other people's glaciers dictate our life, you know, and um, and stop doing positive things. Definitely not. Mm. And sometimes maybe it's good to ignore this person, and sometimes maybe it's possible to talk with this person, and um, and maybe. Uh, everything takes time so maybe instead of the three hours you wanted to meditate you only do two hours and 20 minutes or something you know and start with some compromises it all depends also on your relationship to that person yeah that's why i think it's super difficult to maybe that's why i'm i'm justifying my blockage here because it's it's so it could be so different scenarios Hmm. But yeah, it will work still. It will, I will process it in my mind still. Let's see. Uh, Janavi, what was your point? Yeah, I was just wondering that, you know, um, with regards to dharma, if there is an abusive parent at home, how do you deal with that? Like, you know, because time after time, you're trying, you're trying, you're holding on to your patience and, you know, every time something you go to do, there is an obstruction in between or something negative been said. I mean, ignoring is one, but you know, if you are day in, day out with that person and you know, the parent is just, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know. I've heard so many people that it's for you to uh, you know, uh, family is the first place that you froze it. Yeah, Arni, are you back? Yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, maybe, no maybe the last minute. So, so I, yeah, you have this, let's say there's a parent. So, yeah, so it is said that in dharma, your family is the first place that you practice, you know, uh, this thing. But I mean, you know, sometimes I find it very difficult to deal with my parent, like my father. And it's just, you know, like it feels very unjust like whatever you do how much ever you keep quiet or whatever like there is so much abusive behavior also coming through like you know aggressive passive aggressive aggressive behavior how do you then deal with this um compassionate wise and skillful (laughs) that is always my answer yeah but that uh, means you take the abuse like no 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 that's the thing you know it, it really depends because um we of course don't want to um, let other people create a habit of being abusive, you know, definitely not. Um, so therefore for their sake also, for them, you know, we have to stop them, you know, being abusive. And um, it's of course difficult if in case you are, exactly. yeah, if you're living with them and you are dependent on them maybe financially, but still um, they need to understand at some point, you know, that you is, you are you and they are there 
and um, you have your own rights and um, your own path or style in life. Um, but um, yeah, also, f I mean, it's it's so. But my point is, it's it's of course good for you and um, people around you if you can do your meditation, um, and it's also good for them if you um, if you sort of. Yeah, if you generally make them stop being abusive, yes. Um, but that is super difficult, yeah. Yeah, it is because how much ever you ignore and you just keep quiet or sometimes like, like I have so many times made a resort to myself to not get angry when something like this happens. And there I am again, when something like this happens, I'm holding, holding, focusing on my breath. And then when it goes over the top, so I mean, what do you still then do? Because the merits, and I know the merits are going, but I'm okay to let the merit go in those moments, you know, like, I don't care, let it go. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, definitely for, for yourself, um, just if you forget the others, then yeah, patience is definitely the answer. But really patience doesn't mean to be passive, but just that you are able to remain, remain a peaceful mind, you know, that's all, you know, and, and, and that is a strength. Um, so it's not like weakness where we just passively uh, let bad things happen. Um, so that is definitely a general advice so that you can stay peace, peaceful and calm and open and compassionate and wise. Therefore, patience definitely for oneself is always good. You know, just to differentiate, but then how you react to the other person, that is a, a different thing, you know. But for your, for your own sake, for your own practice, and that is what Shantideva's main point here is, um, yeah, don't get angry because it's just destroying you so much. Um, what do you think? Um, <laughs> but, but it's so difficult, you know, because if, if you live with these people, you know, it's, it's much easier if you'd only occasionally have enemies, <laughs> you know, then, then there, you have many more methods and many more spaces and dimensions. Right. So then one of the thing is that I'm also studying the Buddhist philosophy. So I'm just going to now call Kalimpong, shifting out there. So I was just thinking whether I am running away or escaping, but it's been quite of some quite some time that I've been giving it a try. So I was just thinking that then would that come under, you know, running away from your lessons or escaping your lessons because it's just so difficult you know like sometimes you just don't have the wisdom and means to deal with such people yes and and and, and that also sometimes it could be escapism or however it's called that you're running away but often maybe that's still the most healthy thing to do yeah i mean yeah. buddha shakya or prince Siddhartha also ran away you know and um and yes, he had a manipulative father, we could say, you know. Um, I mean, yeah, he was actually. Yeah. And um, maybe not, yeah, maybe more passive aggressive, you know, and not like maybe shouting at Prince Data. Um, but he, the, the king, the father, was also trying to block Shantideva's spiritual path. And yes, um, there, there could have been the option that Shantideva was strong enough, maybe, and... Um, and could have dealt with that difficult situation and staying at the palace, but he chose to, to not do it, you know, to, to uh, find a more conducive environment. And that is also a big, big topic in, in chapter eight, you know, that it's, that we need a conducive uh, yeah. environment and that is, uh, and could be people, but Shantideva is actually more talking about solitude, you know, like what Buddha Shakyamuni also did in the end, you know, he was not going, to the city or um, or to a temple to meditate, but he just went to a tree, you know, and and um, so therefore, um, yeah, I, I would. It's gen generally what it's difficult to judge what is better or worse to do. Um, but um, if I have the chance, for example, in my life, and something negative or difficult happens, then yes, I, I of course try to activate all my wisdom, compassion and skillful means and try to stay in the situation and deal with it constructively. But quite often it's overwhelming and then it's better to keep a distance, you know? Yeah. And Buddha Shakyamuni, let's say, did that, but also with the promise and the wish to 
come back, you know, once he is stronger <laughs> and one, once yeah, he yeah. is more able, you know, and she did that, that. of course, yeah. Yeah, so therefore you are leaving sort of in good terms, you know, it's just, it's neither good for, um, let's say, the king, nor for Considata, nor for all sentient beings, if he would just stay in, in the palace and be manipulated and brainwashed. But in, the, in and then, yeah, short term, it was, of course, very shocking and maybe painful that he left. But in the long term, it was better for the king even and for Prince Data and for all sentient beings. Right. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. That <laughs> settled in quite well. So, <laughs> thanks a lot. But it's really hard, you know. I know I normally had like difficult people in my job, you know, or in some projects, and then it's much easier to deal with that because there's more space and um, and I can recover in between, you know. And it's easier to change the habits, you know. But if if you live like since thirty years together, maybe you know, then there is so so seemingly unchangeable habits. I mean, not yeah, but they are so firm or solid, rigid. And that makes it so difficult to, to be the change we want to see, you know. Okay. Emilia. <laughs> well, I um I am not psychologist, but I actually have been um in abusive situations and uh, and one at work. Um and I, so I had, I read about it because it goes, it's not, um, it's not just the occasional irritation. People, when depending on the style of abuse, can be the silent abuse, can be the shouting and so on, but they, they take one as a target and work on the destroying the self-esteem of the person. That's the mental disease. And then once it's, destroyed, they move on, but it's, it's, there is a target. And then I also read that once you've been that experience, other abusers actually recognize you and they actually have experiments like showing, they can identify people who have been victims of abuse. But then when I, the literature I read, because uh, it, it was a very complicated situation. I had just moved to Sweden, you know, and a year later I had someone shouting at me and, uh, and they, they, the common advice, I didn't find anything different from all the different places. They just say, leave, leave. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, cause it, it goes as if it, it goes undermining your core and as much as you love the person, but, uh, and I, I, I I moved and moved to a different department and it was, I couldn't stay in that place. You no, know, wouldn't, wouldn't be healthy. It would just totally the mindset. And this was before embracing Buddhism. But anyway, even if I had already embraced, I don't think I would have stayed. I would try to protect myself in that way, but in a loving way, as uh, I mentioned last, last week when we met, I mean, it was, or maybe when we were with Sona, I don't remember, but it was like transformational because I look at the person, the abuser doesn't, didn't only abuse me, just abuse everyone. And, uh, but they don't get rid of him. And, uh, and I, I felt, I feel love, real wish for him to be happy. So it's really important, but doesn't mean I would go back and work with the person. Of course, a parent, is a very it is difficult, but I would I would if I were you, or of course they say advice you give if it was really great you would sell you wouldn't give for free, but I would try to find a way to protect yourself, move elsewhere, do have distance, grow strong, and then lovingly, occasionally, um, you know get in touch with him because this is is heavy when you read personality and the you know the the triage it's i think it's really heavy stuff 
what those minds are doing to others. I met women who have been in abusive relationships. It's quite, uh, you know, I don't know why. And I think, I think it can be compassionate, but also protecting oneself and saying, I don't, I'm not going to be um, in, in this environment. Depends, maybe, you know, someone who, who has a really very strong practice and decides to stay for the sake of, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stay and uh, I'll do like a, a strong bodhisattva. I'll, I'll do and I'll, I'll see how I can help. Well, I wouldn't have that kind of structure. Yeah, thank you. And Daniel, mm -hmm. before you say something, I wanted to say something too. Um, also, like generally in Buddhism and Shantideva's text, I think also at one point says that we should, um, yeah, we should be very careful um, if we deal with people who, um, yeah, are uh, having negative emotions and who, or who stimulate negative emotions in us. So I'm saying that uh, because the whole idea of being ordained, you know, like a nun or monk is, uh, it, not the whole idea, but the big part is because um, it's not, for example, that sex is bad or relationships are bad in general, but um, they they have chastity because then because of the knowledge that maybe it's just too too much to be in a relationship, you know. <laughs> too, there are too many emotions coming up, you know, like desire or lust, you know. Because now we talk a lot about anger, but the opposite, like desire or lust, is 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 also a problem from Buddhist point of view, and, and therefore it is commonly accepted, you know, to get ordained, you know, and just avoid those situations that are not conducive, you know, like let's say relationships. And they distract you from the path, basically, because you're trying to build on something and do something, and it just keeps distracting all of these things. Yes, and therefore. Um, yeah, I think generally, if if possible, if if and so generally, if you see that it's just overwhelming, you know, uh, the situation that you are in, and you just don't have the power or the skills or the abilities to to transform it into something positive for all, then it's very legitimate in in on the Buddhist path, you know, to to keep a distance, you know, um, like you know the the whole. Uh, um, the whole, <laughs> what is it? The whole tradition, you know, of being ordained is is that, you yeah. know, it is it is leaving the situation that is difficult, you know. Um, Danielle? Yeah, just to, to follow up Jan Harvey's situation, having lived through something kind of similar, um, in my experience, having withdrawn from it from, for, se for several years, I've now been able to come back in and be really be of service, really be present, like authentically not carrying the stuff um, to them. And the, re re the reaction and the response is so positive as well. So there was a big gap. But it doesn't matter now because what's here now is so good. And and it was a quite a quite a cut, you know, a, a definitive cut for X number of years. But I can really be there for them now. They're quite old, and I'm really there for them, like authentically, and it's really nice. So just just to let you know, even to to do that doesn't mean once and forever yeah thank you like Prince Siddhartha who came back as the Buddha like now the stronger and more powerful and compassionate and wise Daniel, Daniel, Daniel and then yeah you are of much more benefit and um, yeah I'm sure she, Daniel she maybe you couldn't have developed those qualities if you would have stayed you know and continuously stayed you know that therefore yeah the um, the gap or distance is, is important, yeah. 
and, and that is true for everything, you know, and, and like alcohol, people who are alcoholics, they also do that, you know, that, yes, don't go in the bar, you know, like keep your distance from situations where you used to drink, you know, and, and um, yeah, and I, I do that, I think um, I heard that that is the advice sort of, you know, like in every day, you know, when I, when I come to a difficult situation, then yeah, let's try the, the highest method, you know, like Chokcha Mahamudra, you know, and then if that doesn't work, then downgrade a little bit your your approach and try Vajrayana. If that doesn't work, try um, uh, compassion and so on. If that doesn't work, leave, you know, practice renunciation, you know, um, and, and yeah, create the distance. So, so it's, you, you can always aim high, but then be realistic and see what is what are you able to do in that situation. And therefore, yeah, in, in the in the course of one day, yeah, sometimes I'm a, I'm a Mahayana practitioner, and then some often I'm I'm just a person who needs to run away, you know? <laughs> but with a good motivation. That's the point. You know? Okay, let's come back to Shantideva. Um, yeah, and uh, um, yeah, thank you, Daniela, and everybody for for sharing your stories. Um, <laughs> And here, Jangjo wrote something like um, ages ago. <laughs> and he wrote, <laughs> we're using ages because it is about time in, like in his question. Buddhahood beyond time um, is, I think, is a saying. So, how can it, Buddhahood, uh, be achievable in our present time? Impossible? Question mark, or better dedicate merit properly? I think that is a good question to be asked to Buddha Maitreya. <laughs> Um, like it's more like a Buddha nature kind of <laughs> teaching. <laughs> um, but the, the thing is, yes, from ultimate truth point of from ultimate truth point of view, um, um, yeah, Buddhahood um, is beyond time, um, and uh, we are always Buddhas, sort of, you know. But from the relative point of view. Um, let's talk about me. I have adventitious defilements and therefore I'm not seeing it. Mm. But that is very a very temporal, adventitious, uh, removable problem. And so from ultimate point of view, from Buddha nature point of view, mm, yeah, Buddhahood is beyond time. It, we have never been non-Buddhas from Buddha nature point of view. But from the relative point of view, um, yeah, I still need to to remove these temporal temporal defilements through the path, mm. and so um, Buddhahood is achievable. But again, from relative point of view, I I would have to say I'm not a Buddha now, but in the future I become a Buddha. So that is a very relative time and time bound and linear perspective. But from absolute point of view, um, yeah, I have I have never been not a Buddha, you know, and I only, yeah, that's it, you know. Mm. And then on the relative level, whatever uh, practice is is best for you, do it, and yeah, you suggest dedicate the merit properly. That is definitely a great practice. But that is really like a little bit uh, different um, type of teachings than what uh, Shantideva is presenting here at the moment. There are some verses in chapter nine that, that go in that direction where he's really giving those pip instructions, you know, what to do when um, concepts sort of um, subside. Okay, then um, 104. Now my screen is totally packed because I had two mon monitors, but now one one stopped, that's why I was frozen. And so everything is, all the files are somewhere. <laughs> um, so 104 is here. That's where we are, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if without it, something does not occur, and if with it, it does come to be, then since uh, this enemy would be the cause of patience, how can I say that he prevents it? Okay, it's so many it's, so we have to know which it refers to which thing. Um, 
Can you show that again, please? Again? <laughs> Sorry, he said to... <laughs> there were so many... It's, but um, it's, really it's so complicated. You can't display it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I just... Um, because I don't like to share so much. I just put it here on the... In the it's in the chat now, Pallavi. Um, okay. Because then I can see you guys properly. Um, if I'm okay. not sharing. But you can read it, right? Yeah. Here we can. Um, so, um, so basically, we still have the doubt um, of that the enemy is hindering the accumulation of our merit. Um, and the, the, the main answer here is, um, no, the, the enemies are really important factors for our Dharma practice. Mm. They, of course, they are, they are never the cause, because now let's go back to Maitreya and Buddha nature teachings, you know, the cause is of, is of course the Buddha nature in us, you know, and then our own uh, bodhicitta and practice and wisdom and love and compassion and so on, that is the main cause, but the Buddha nature is always the main cause. But nevertheless, the, um, the enemies are important factors or contributing factors or um, to, to, to inspire us to practice or to, to develop bodhicitta. So if we, I hope you all can see the, the chat. Um, so if we look at the first line, if without it, so if without the enemy, mm. oh no, we can just make a general uh, first. Uh, that is maybe the, the thing. Um, is it simple? Yeah, we, we come to that. So, so the idea is just very, very simple, you know, like we're talking about causality. So if we have a cause, and let's say the conducive conditions, then we will have a result. So if we have the seed, um, and yeah, we have the warmth and oxygen and water, and time, whatever, then we get the tree. Yeah, so cause brings result. If, if we have a cause and the conditions, then we have the result. If we don't have the cause, if we don't have the seed, then we will never have a tree there. You know? Very simple. And so mm, the logic here is, um, so if we have the cause, which is the enemies here, it's, it's not, of course, not the real cause, but for the time being, let's say it's like that. So if we have the cause, the enemies, then enlightenment is possible. That is the idea here, causality, wise speaking and if we don't have the cause if we don't have the enemy um, then we cannot attain enlightenment because we cannot practice patience so that is the, that is the general idea here about cause and result so the enemies here are seen as a cause but philosophically speaking it, it's more like a very important factor let's say conducive factor that is necessary for the result of enlightenment to happen. Um, so if without an enemy, we cannot practice patience. For example, it is said like in the God realm, you know, everything is going too well, you know, the gods and goddesses, they're looking too good and too handsome and there is no friction sort of, you know, in, in the whole God realm, you always have what you wish and therefore there is no chance to practice uh, patience. Um, so, so if so, here the first line. If we if we remove the the cryptic words, so if without uh, enemies, um, enlightenment or patience does not occur. That would be the first line. So something is uh, patience that the enemy evokes. Yes, and then in the extension or long run, the enlightenment, and then the second line. And if with it, so, and if we have an enemy or a obstruction or problem or challenging situations, it, the patient, patience comes to be. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So if there's an enemy, I have the chance to practice patience. Um, again, you know, if we use uh, Jan Harvey's uh, overwhelming situation, then that is, uh, yeah, that, that happens. Uh, as I said, daily in my life, it happens or something is overwhelming and then I cannot practice patience. But Shantideva is more talking about this workable situation scheme. 
um, third line, then since this enemy, and enemy is not in the root text, that's why it's in brackets, um, would be the cause of patience. Again, from debate point of view or philosophy point of view, um, yeah, I think Abhidharma point of view, basically, they're not the cause, but they're a very necessary condition, let's say, like, like a teacher, a, a guru, you know, is also not the cause for our enlightenment, but she or he is super important, uh, a super important condition on our path. And likewise, so, so I teach, a, a guru is a, um, a, a very conducive uh, condition, mostly through his positive influence, <laughs> and then sentient beings can be a very conducive uh, condition because of their negative <laughs> behavior towards us in this context, yeah, if patience is our aim, you know. And then um, the last line, how can I say that he prevents it? Um, so if I if you paraphrase it, so therefore we can say, um, so there's no way that the enemy is an obstacle to our merit. So how can I say that the enemy prevents the accumulation of merit? It's very cryptic. And I think when, if, if one wants to translate from Tibetan, one needs to have a teacher, a teacher to, to explain it. Because if all, all the big words, the, the, the nomens or uh, subjects are missing, you know, then it's, yeah, it, it's like it's here, it, 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 it. But I, I hope you got it. It's really the basic uh, causality. And it comes back to the same mind training slogan that um, Shantideva was sort of repeating all the time, you know, that we should not perceive an enemy as an enemy because um, if we can deal with that difficult situation, then that is actually a conducive situation that brings us closer to enlightenment. Okay, then um, the next one, 105, maybe I just copy it also in the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, now he's uh, explaining that that same logic in the context of the other parameters, um, not all other parameters, but first we have generosity. And then we have um, discipline, and then we have patience. And so here in this verse um, 105, he is explaining the other conducive um, factors for our practice of that um, respected parameter. So if we start with uh, generosity, it is saying a beggar is not an obstacle to generosity when I'm giving something away. Yeah. So a beggar is actually a right condition, a conducive condition for me to practice generosity. I think Ken Sarimput just said, you know, if we, if we make a big announcement, um, let's say on Facebook, you know, tomorrow, nine o'clock in the morning, I will give away money or food or clothes, you know, and then at a specific place. And then if, if at that time, at that place, no beggar shows up, then yes, we cannot practice generosity. Um, but we need their presence, their showing up um, in, as the conducive um, factor or conducive condition so that we have the chance uh, to practice generosity. So therefore beggars are not an obstacle to our generosity practice, but they are very con the conducive condition uh, for us practicing generosity. Okay, that I think was more easy. Now the second one, um, it's, I find it a little bit more difficult, but it's the same idea. Now we're talking about discipline. And here we're talking about um, ordination or taking vows or precepts. Um, so here it says, and I cannot say that those who give ordination are an obstacle to becoming ordained. Um, yeah, maybe it's not so difficult. So. Um, so we have, let's say, a Rinpoche, an, an abbot normally, you know, or, or an elder nun or monk. And he or she is giving us ordinations through a ritual. 
So then, of course, this habit or this temperature is a conducive condition for us to take these vows. And of course, not an obstacle uh, um, to, to the ceremony or not an obstacle for us to take the vows. Yeah, I think not, not, it's not so difficult. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so, so, so the beggar was an important uh, factor for us to practice generosity. Let's say the, the Lama is an important factor for us to take the vows and the precepts that we want to have. And likewise, um, the, the enemies, that means whoever uh, destroys um, our hope and fear, you know, the eight worldly dharmas, is actually um, not an obstacle, but it's a conducive, he or she is a conducive factor for our practice of patience. Okay. <laughs> And then um, that is a little bit elaborated in verse 106. And then afterwards, let's discuss again if you have something. Um, now he's um, 106, he's praising again the, the, um, the enemy. Um, so if we first look at parameter number one, which is the generosity, where we needed the beggars, right? So here Shantideva is saying there are indeed many beggars in this world. Of course, beggar is just a representative of somebody who needs something from us. You know, it could be also a friend of us who, who needs a phone call, phone call or a friend of us who needs some, I don't know, um, uh, an advice how, how to um, work on a computer. It doesn't matter. So it um, could be so many different things. So, um, so, so Shadideva is basically saying generosity practice is very easy because there is so much poverty in the world. So there are so many poor people and therefore we have so many chances to practice generosity. Um, again, it doesn't have to be really like giving material things, but the other generosities are like giving fearlessness, you know, or, could be also giving our time, giving our ear, you know, to listen to somebody. Um, so there's so much need for that in the world. So it's very easy to practice generosity. And then the second, it's not actually um, mentioned here in the verse, but if we want to practice discipline, if we want to take vows or take precepts, then that is sort of also possible. I mean, because there are quite many lamas in this world, yeah? There are more beggars in the world, <laughs> but, but there's still a substantial amount of lamas in the world. So therefore we have quite a lot of chances to take the precepts and take the vows. And by that um, practice discipline, the second parameter. But, and now comes the problem. Mm. But from Sunday Deva's point of view, there are not so many en enemies in the world, you know? Um, Especially the commentators say that, you know, especially if you're a good person, <laughs> um, you know, if, if you're a, a, really a Bodhisattva, then, and you're not inflicting harm to others, normally, you know, the, the people are sort of okay and nice with you, you know. Of course, there are many exceptions, and um, maybe Shantideva was saying that he could say that easily because he was a good person. But then the monks actually were, <laughs> were challenging him a lot because they, they thought he was lazy and not doing anything in the, for the monastery. Mm. But uh, generally still, I think the idea is if we are really a bad person, you know, like angry with others, and if we steal and lie all the time, you know, and beat people up and shout, pe shout at people, you know, then it's easier to get enemies, you know, and then we have more, more chances to practice patience, you know because we have more enemies. But really Shanideva's point here is we, we don't have so many enemies actually in our lives, let's say. And therefore um, it is very difficult to practice uh, practice patience because we, we, we need enemies for the patience practice. And um, yeah, I think that's, um, 
that's sort of it. Um, Uh, and yeah, in the commentaries, there are many examples of um, of the opposite, <laughs> or not of the opposite, but for uh, how it is if you are really a good person, and then how much um, you actually can tame the mind of other people. I think Jungshub in the very beginning asked something, right? How we how we can maybe deal with somebody who is angry with us, you know? That is of course, um, if we have this, if we really have a lot of experience or realization of bodhicitta. As I said in the commentaries, many masters are mentioned, you know, who have that ability, then by that bodhicitta, you can really subjugate, subjugate the negative emotions of others. You know, you have that, I think in Vajrayana, it's called this authentic presence, you know, this majestic thing, you know, that is really like overpowering, overpowering um, the negativities of others. That would be of course ideal and yeah examples there are like um buddha shakyamuni you know um, um, who uh, like um, his cousin devadatta wanted to kill buddha shakyamuni by sending like a mad or drunk elephant to buddha shakyamuni but he could just through his bodhicitta or presence he could yeah, tame the uh, the elephant um, and who sit down in front of Buddha Shakyamuni then. Or maybe you know the stories of Milarepa, you know, when there was the hunter, you know, and then there was the the the, um, the deer that was hunted and that was full of fear. And then came the dog who was full of anger, you know. Um, so and Milarepa through his bodhicitta could transform both their minds, you know, and so they were sitting peacefully next to him, you know, and without fear and without hope or anger, you know. And then also the hunter came, you know, and he was also um, not amused. <laughs> then Mila Rehba could uh, also deal with that, you know, and he became, the hunter became a disciple. Yeah, so, so um, Bodhisattva basically has that power, you know, to, to not only calm our mind, um, but also, yeah, not only have this transformative effect on our mind, but also on, on the people around us. And um, yeah, if so, and, and the, the, the point is, since, um, and maybe because he was talking to, to, to good monks in the monastery. So if, if, if these good monks had, um, really good practice of bodhicitta, then it's very difficult for them to find enemies. And therefore, if they found, find enemies, they should use the chance and not get angry, but use the chance properly by practicing patience. So <laughs> that is the whole, whole idea here. There are many beggars, therefore generosity is easy to practice. There are quite many lamas, therefore it's easy to get the vows and practice discipline, but there are not so many enemies in our lives, therefore it's difficult to practice patience. Is there something you want to discuss on that? I, I'm just amazed by how he thought all of these possibilities in that era. I'm like, oh my God, like the more I read about his patients and his chapters, it's like so amusing. I mean, at, in the eighth century era of somebody being so clever and somebody who was known to be sleeping, eating and shitting only. <laughs> yeah, but that was of course the impure perception of the of his colleagues. Yeah, I mean, say, yeah, yeah. Somebody, that's why I said somebody who was known to be like. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I heard that. Not yeah, really. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Like, um, and Shantideva was in the sixth, seventh century, seventh, I think, yeah. And um, eight, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they eight? Yeah. Let me Google that. Um, I always, I'm always bad in the stating game here. Yeah. I only um, remember this one, that's why I'm confident. <laughs> yeah, but I, I always, I always, I think I also remember <laughs> Lord Google says, Daniel, um, yeah, seven to eight, Pallavi, you're both right, but you are more right because six, 685 to 763. So 
I think, um, five, yeah. six, five, five parts of his life were in the eighth century and one fifth of his <laughs> life was in the seventh. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And, and yeah, he was a great, great mind. And, and there were so many of these beautiful minds, right? And, and uh, of these masters, like, I mean, Buddha Shakyamuni, of course. And, and then in, through all the centuries, I mean, Nagarjuna was this, I know by heart, 150 to 250. Um, so that was even like 530 years ago, you know, before, before Shantideva. Mm. And, um, yeah, and also later, I mean, we have Longchenpa and and those people, you know, who, those masters, you know, it's amazing. Yeah? I, I really don't know what the Germans did at that time, during Shantideva's time. I think not much. <laughs> they were I'm sure they, what? what? <laughs> they were polishing their skills. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think they were not, never really eating each other, so that kind of mm, discipline they had. But apart from that, I, I think it's not, it was not very cultivated, you know. But I have to look mm. into it. <laughs> okay, then mm, we still have some time. Mm. Then comes hundred seven. And Pallavi, you might know this from Uttara Tantra Shastra. The, the example is a little bit similar, I, I think. Um, oh, yeah, I remember Therefore, this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in Uttara Tantra Shastra, it's like, a, I think it's a very old, I think old doesn't matter so much, but <laughs> don't, 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 it's, it matters. Old. Anyway, mm. so let's say there's a beggar and um, and he or she is having a small place where he or she lives and, um, and owns maybe even that very small place, but has not enough money uh, to, to really buy clothes and food and, and um, medicine. And therefore is living really a very poor life, you know, with very dirty clothes and, and, and with many sicknesses because of the lack of money. But actually um, underneath, <laughs> Her place where she is or he is sleeping every night, a little bit like one meter or wherever, you know, there's a treasure. And um, and actually it, the, the beggar owns that land and therefore the treasure, but uh, the beggar has no awareness about the existence of the treasure. And therefore, yeah, um, I think in the Buddha nature class, we had that uh, discussion. And so the fun question is always, um, so is this beggar rich or poor, you know? And then I remember Pallavi was um, then rightfully bringing in the two truths. <laughs> and so, yes, from ultimate point of view, the beggar is totally rich, but on a relative level, she's very poor because she lacks awareness, you know? And of course, you can, you can connect that to the Buddhist teachings, you know? If you know Buddha nature, then you are a Buddha. If you don't know, Yes, you're a Buddha, but actually you can't, you don't have access to the Buddha qualities, so you can't perform the Buddha activities. So actually, yeah, we are just a poor samsaric being and not helping anyone. Um, so that is, um, <laughs> at least Uttara Tantra says this so much, he has um, story. <clears throat> and um, so Pallavi, when, when was, uh, but when was uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra written down by Asanga? In the fourth century. <laughs> and oh. um, ah, great. Okay. So, so therefore, I, I, it could be that Shantideva is a little bit copy pasting here, which is totally fine. You know, that's that's called lineage. You know, copy pasting. Um, <laughs> no, no, really. That's Kempo Shuring Dorje was saying that, it, and it, I like it. You know, it's. Um, because then it's authentic, you know. Of authentic. course, you can give some notes to it and comments on it, but um, mm -hmm. if you just invent everything, that's then it becomes new age, I guess. Mm. So the point is um, that um, yeah, if if we now understand what the enemy is really doing, so back to patience, yeah, when we. Mm, 
so when we understand what the enemy is doing, then we understand that the enemy is actually um, actually like a treasure, you know. Um, um, so, so it says here, therefore, just like a treasure appearing in my house without any effort on my behalf to obtain it, I should be happy to have an enemy for he or she assists me in my conduct of awakening. So yeah, we, we don't even <laughs> need to take an, make an effort. You know, we can just sit at our house, you know, watching TV, and um, and then suddenly, um, I don't know. We we know about that there's a treasure beneath our house. You know, we get a phone call. I don't know, or whatever. It doesn't matter. And then suddenly, in one moment, we become we we become rich, and our whole life will change. And it's a cause for celebration and the same is also when we get an enemy and normally for an enemy i mean to get an enemy we also don't have to make put so much effort you know that <laughs> happens spontaneously uh, effortlessly and rarely also and then in that moment when there's an enemy then immediately also we have you know, before we, we became rich immediately, and now we have immediately the chance also to become rich in our patience practice. So therefore the enemy is precious and rare, like a treasure like that. And um, I think also there we have, um, um, yeah, a couple of examples. Um, I always forgot Yaitse Tokma, who wrote the 37 practices of the Bodhisattva. I think he also had some, some of these um, mind opening experiences with enemies or difficult situations. Um, definitely what I remember is Gampopa who, um, who was a doctor and had a wife and kids, I think, and then they all died. Mm, so that was the difficulty, that was the enemy and that triggered him uh, to 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 think about something else, you know, and um, to and to think differently, and 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 find the Dharma, and to to look for something uh, that is more reliable, and that is of course realization or seeing the truth. So so that really this difficulty, this enemy of um, I think it was a disease or something i forgot so the, the death of his family was triggering him you know even though it is something very tragic and very negative and there was also one one lama um i forgot his name but he was um he was robbed i think at, at some point he was quite rich because uh, not because he was a very bad lama but um <laughs> so he was that was not his aim but uh, yeah in tibet if you have been a very good lama you know then yes you get a lot of offerings so the lama was very rich and um and then um and then at some point he got robbed and was completely poor and, and then um yeah i think maybe he had a little bit of attachment of course to the wealth and then he decided not to become rich again but completely renounce the world because um, yeah he was totally poor and he understood yeah it would take so much effort and so much worldly and mundane activities to come back to where he has been um, and then he decided um, yeah to take that as a lesson or teaching and and so he became like a yogi in the solitude and um, and he also in the end of his life he, he was really saying that this this robber was really my real lama because um, thanks to him I became a real yogi and um, and yeah I, I overcome many of my negative emotions and therefore um, yeah I'm I'm safe sort of you know I will not take bad rebirths anymore and maybe the most famous is Atisha also who deliberately <laughs> uh, took his enemy with him, you know, this Bengali tea boy who was very annoying. And um, I think um, 
I think he did that actually, Atisha, you know, came from India. And I think Atisha like wrongly assumed that Tibetans are like very nice and good natured and, <laughs> and friendly people. So therefore he thought, okay, I should take one patient's tester with me, you know? <laughs> and so it was his tea or cook. Or cook or, or, and so he took this, this um, very annoying and short tempered Bengali uh, man or boy with him. Um, yeah, to 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 like um, push Atisha's buttons um, on a daily basis, <laughs> sort of. You know? um, and yes, Atisha was. So that that is diff different from me, you know, because um, I get overwhelmed, you know, if some if I have difficulties, and then it's good for me to to escape a little bit, you know, or do some go somewhere else, you know. But Atisha is a different caliber, so he could actively invite trouble, you know, to, to and then use it. Um, so that's a possibility also. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I really, at my level, uh, I, and then I'm looking for friends who are supportive and positive and conducive, you know, um, because there, there is enough problems or challenges in my life anyway, you know, so I, I, I'm not actively looking for more. <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe at some point, you know, we can all become more like Atisha and um, everything is so good. So we, <laughs> we need to have this poking constantly and invite somebody to do that. So I think we made it. Um, and we are coming a little bit sooner or later, we're coming to the end of this chapter six. <laughs> um, I think we didn't cover so many verses, but it doesn't matter, I hope. Um, so thank you. And um, yeah, let's dedicate. I think we talked a little bit about dedication. I can't find it. Yeah, and if we, uh, yeah, when we come to the um, chapter 10, um, I think there are like three or four subheadings of chapter 10. And one is, I think, one is even dedicating for one's own benefit and um, I forgot a little bit. Uh, one subheading is we benefit for the sake of all sentient beings. And one dedication is that we, uh, as a, so yeah, we dedicate for the benefit of all sentient beings and we dedicate for the longevity of the Dharma. Mm -hmm. So here we have these two prayers and one is for the sake of all sentient beings and then the other one for the longevity of Dharma. By this merit, having attained omniscience and defeated the enemy of wrongdoing, may free all beings from the ocean of existence with its tumultuous wave of birth, old age, sickness, and death. May I, in each and every lifetime, carry the weight of Buddha Shakyamuni's teachings. And if I cannot wear, bear that weight, at the very least may I be born with the burden of thinking that the Buddha Dharma could reign. Oh, and I forgot one thing, um, and Ken Rinpoche is quite often actually um, talking about it. Aspiration is a big thing also. If, um, like maybe what Danielle did or what Prince Hidata did when they left the family, you know. Um, so the aspiration, so based on the acknowledgement that I cannot deal with this situation constructively, you know, nobody is benefited here in this situation. And then, yeah, Rinpoche is really praising the, the power of aspiration so that we then aspire to be to be able to, to deal with those kind of situations and that we aspire to be of benefit to those negative or difficult people. You know, that, that is also a big thing that we should do, he says. I forgot that. Okay, thank you everybody and thank you for sharing. 
I have what? a question. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering that uh, when is the next session happening and where will you put it up then? So when, I don't know yet, but it will be in October. <laughs> so okay. much I know. And um, it is always on the Data Intent website, but if you give me your email address, uh, I yep. can also yeah. put you on a list. Do you have yes. my email address? No, I don't have. Can you share it with me? Yes, there are many, but this one is the easiest here. Um, yeah, just write me and then, um, uh, yeah. I put you on the list. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't have so much regularity in life, and um, <laughs> and and also, I'm organizing um, other events with uh, teachers. Um, and for example, today, Palavi, I asked Carl for for his <laughs> his dates for November. So I asked these uh -huh. teachers first, you know, and once they confirm their their dates, then I'm coming up with my dates, and then I'm posting them and so it's very irregular but uh, I always try to have two sessions uh, per month in August I managed zero sessions um, but that had other reasons but in September we had actually three now so <laughs> okay thank you guys Take thank, care. You. thank you all thank you Arne. Bye bye. Ciao, bye. Bye. thank you bye. Ciao.